Hi, my name is Adam and uh, welcome to another edition of South Wales Ghost Watch. And today we're going to be talking about, um, well, a few things really. The reality of magic, uh, which is uh, neo-paganism in the modern world, alien abduction and also fairy abduction as well. Now I'm here with my guest today, uh, Martin Shrewsbury. Hi. And uh, this is Anthony Cherry. Hi. Okay. And the first question I want to ask you, or well, the first topic we'll discuss today, will be the reality of magic. Okay, um, I'll aim this question to uh, Dr. Shrewsbury here. Uh, Martin, where did the term magic come from? It comes from the Persian word, the Magi. It's the Magi who traditionally visited the infant Christ. They were wise people from the East who knew about how the world operated. So Magi, magic. Um, it's very common, I suppose, to consider that science has replaced magic. And it used to be believed that we evolved, if you like, from magic to religion to science. But one of the interesting things is that in the modern world, um, a lot of people are looking at different ways in the world works. And if you look at the quantum physics with the idea that every electron knows where every other electron is, and that reality is not as precise as we think. We quickly learn how we manipulate and control and develop the world. So you could argue that magic is an attempt at a technology to understand how the world operates and how to help yourself and others. It's a technology as well that of course can be used for both good and for bad. Mm. Mm. And consequently, uh, magic is not a primitive superstition. It's a way of making sense of the world. Yeah. A spell simply means a way of changing consciousness uh, and affecting cons consciousness, which then affects reality. We all do that. We all think if we're going to have a lucky day, we have a lucky pen to do an exam or whatever, or if we see something, <coughs> of thing, it does that. If we think positively, that may be the earliest spell that any of us yeah, ever sure. manage. Mm -hmm. And tribal people dance, sing, chant, because it gives them a way of dealing and coping with the challenges. So magic can't be seen as ignorance. There are Coptic, if you go back to um, post-Christian, uh, well, Christian Egypt before the Islamic inventions, you'll find lots of spells against the Coptic Christians. So magic needs to be looked at. If you look at the Harry Potter films and the, 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 uh, the, the, the uh, attraction there, it's about dealing with the darker side of yourself, rising above it, and learning how to deal with things in the world. So magic is effectively uh, a belief that the world can be manipulated, changed, developed. So I always like to think, like, uh, technology as well this day. Yes. It could be, like, uh, modern-day magic, maybe, in science oh, yes. as well. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it always fascinates me. If I went back 500 years in time and took what I got on me now, such as even the lighter, mm. I mean, you know, can imagine taking her back to yes. the peasants 500 years ago and just going, yeah, shh. Yeah. With the lighter. So they'd be like, whoa, they'd be down in front, wouldn't they? They'd be, like, fantastic. Okay, so do you think science and magic, are they the same thing, or are they... I think it's like different, something. I think it's come along with the times, you yes. know. Yes. Yeah. yeah. I think is uh, now that we have science and it's beginning to actually prove things. What science is, is in a nutshell, is for it to be reproduced in a laboratory in front of people and not witnesses and actually mm. see proven right. That is science because it's like fact. It happens. Okay. Yeah. So I think what magic does also is just hinders at the. Yeah, indeed. I mean, if you think of somebody who's seen as a founder of modern science, Isaac Newton, there's a very interesting biography called uh, Isaac Newton, The Last of the Magicians. The idea was that if you studied science, you also studied these things as well. Yeah. And that's conveniently forgotten. There's all sorts of blurry edges in modern belief that shows there isn't a rigorous science thinking. There isn't a rigorous religious uh, boundary. There are, there's a stream of, if you like, continuing through all three. Okay. Yeah. 
Awesome. And that's, that's, that's effectively how it is. Okay. So, um, magic compared to um, an illusion, is that the same thing? Um, is an illusionist well, and a magician the same thing? Uh, well, entertainment purposes. Entertainment purposes, <laughs> right. uh, Many of the stage magicians are actually uh, sceptics. Yeah, and very clever. And very well. clever at what they do. Mm. Yeah. Um, but the idea largely, the difference is that according to tribal peoples or any modern practitioner, it's the intent of what you do that changes things. And that intent and that power is very, very useful and can be achieved in different sorts of ways. I think in the first Harry Potter book, he says, uh, J.K. Rowling says in the book, Harry notices that whenever he gets emotional, he's able to shift things. Mm. Now, I think that's interesting. That's interesting, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. very interesting. Oh, it never kind of words, it certainly does. Yeah. Okay. Right, okay, well, um, moving on. Um, we'll talk about witches next. Now, um, I've got quite a few questions to ask you uh, regarding witches. So, um, I'll start with Anthony this time. <laughs> I haven't asked you a question yet. Um, so, when did witches first come, come around, Anthony? I think witches, or that kind of essence of what they would be called is um, back in the day, uh, herb gatherers and just mm -hmm. herb workers. And, mm -hmm. you know, and they were the, the wise women of uh, you know, local civilizations, even when we were hunter gatherers. That's like you know, when shamanism mm -hmm. came around. I'm sure they, they would have been classed as witches back then. But the term witch is um, a bit more medieval. Mm -hmm. And it was introduced like, from the medieval persecutions where witch was really used as a term for them as bad practice. Yeah, because uh, yeah, when you think effect. of a witch, you also think of something evil or something dark. Mm. Uh, and uh, in some cases, the stereotypical view of a witch is 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 some someone evil or dark, you know. But yeah. uh, which has been put across yeah. by society and the way uh, modern Orthodox religion yeah. has put that across as we're bad people, witches, and they are you know Satan's through mm. Satan's bidding and Satan's work. The, the historical pattern is that. When one religion replaces another, it tends to say that the lot before them are evil. Mm. Um, and as Anthony said, the, um, the idea of Wicca comes from, and I think it is an Anglo-Saxon word, meaning wise folk. Um, and it's just very convenient to find out that there's all these evil people out there because you can settle some scores. Yeah. Um, if you go back even further than that, you find that a knowledge of herb craft, a knowledge of the moon, a knowledge of whatever, um, is very useful. But when one institution comes in the church or whatever, it says, these people are wrong. They are evil. There's a classic mistake of uh, the devil. Uh, the witches worship the devil. The witches do not worship the devil. According to the, to the analysis, only a Christian priest who has gone over to the dark side could be a Satanist. Uh, pagans are not uh, Satan worshippers. No, accusing cares. a pagan of worshipping Satan would be like accusing uh, an atheist of believing in God. Okay. I think that's probably a, yeah. a reasonable word. So, with witchcraft and sorcery and alchemy, are they the same thing or are they, are they different? Well, how do they differ? Um, Going for the same intention, but out for a different outcome. Alchemy is based more in a kind of a, well, how can I describe it? It's like your, like your potions and that kind of thing. Your potions yeah. you use, even like, you know, today's modern alchemy, that's give us more hair, so they get yeah. this particular shampoo. Okay. Yeah. Um, again, the sorcery, that's more invocation kind of thing. Mm. This is, it's more grand, as it were. And it's more like to bring in something, a nether being, to do work for the sorcerer. Okay. Yeah, and then witchcraft and Wicca. I think that is more, again, spell work. But then there's more uh, the intention of that as well, just to help people around them or help themselves. So it's the same kind of mm. similar thing. It's all intention and it's all a focus and it's an energy which is created for some particular reason. For and, and, and to help people as well. Uh, to help people. Yeah, yeah. To help yeah I think you'd find that um, if you think of the Shakespeare's classical play Macbeth, Macbeth was written at the time when James I became the King of England and Scotland. James was very concerned that people were trying to sink him or whatever. And he distinguished between sorcery and um, witchcraft. If you think of the three witches in Macbeth, they're ordinary country women who aren't good, aren't bad, 
they just tell people what they ask. <laughs> Lady Macbeth is the sorcerer. Okay. Um, and that's the problem there. Shakespeare is writing that to, to, so that people are clear that there's a threat. Yeah, that, that there are threats. It's, it's a political yeah. purpose yeah. because King James I is newly established. He probably wouldn't have thought of that consciously, but he wants to see there's a threat out there. Mm. So all these people are doing these things, um, but nevertheless, it would be the country people, the country women in particular, who would have done these charms in an area, in a position where you're very fragile, where the crops might fail. You need people. Sorcery writes, sorcerers write long, detailed books about what they do when they chant it in Latin. Okay. And uh, Queen Elizabeth I's spy master, John Dee, was an accomplished sorcerer. Mm. Yeah. Uh, in that sense, he wrote lots of interesting books. And it's all very fuzzy. I think what happened in the 16th century is the church found that the country people said, OK, well, OK, we, we'll accept that, but we have other ways. And the churches were horrified to discover what had happened. And I think the witch crazes were an unleashment to deal with all these strange beliefs that they had in Upcomtuk or wherever, yeah. you know, yeah. places like that. Enforcement. Also. Enforcement of rigorous patterns. Yes. Yeah, controlling a society. Yeah. Probably starting with that, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Okay, next question I've got, I've got to ask you is, um, I'll, I'll aim this at Anthony, um, are Wicca and Witchcraft the same thing? Wicca and Witchcraft the same thing? Um, Wicca has more of an Anglo-Saxon origin. Okay. Witchcraft would be an amalgam of practical things that were used, if you like, in everyday life. Um, witchcraft is a mass title that we give to folk beliefs or whatever. People today, probably modern neopagans, would probably more use the word Wicca uh, than call themselves witches. The word still has a very negative title. Mm. And um, I think what you have to distinguish is between folk beliefs and a more formed regular pattern when we come on to neo-paganism, we can probably talk about that in a more distinctive way, because yeah. we're different, different groups there. Okay, that's, that's fair enough. So, so that'll blend on to that subject. Yes, too, quite right? easily. That's, that's cool, fair enough. Okay, so witches, who do they worship? Nature, in a nutshell. Yeah. They worship what's around them. Okay. They use what's around them for, for the good of themselves, for the good of society. But they're a local group, you know, and they'll worship the seasons. Seasons which we follow Sabbaths, times of year. But there's particular energies which are lined up for them to do particular ceremonies. Okay. For them to embrace the power of nature and for it to worship the nature as it is. You know, spring, summer, autumn, winter, equinoxes. They got their different things which they bring to all the practice of Okay. You know, and uh, they just use the seasons as like before the calendar, before one electric and all the rest of it. These are like, the gathering methods, you know, so around Halloween, you know, Samhain. We used a lot of like gathering and like a festival for the for the people who've passed the spirits, you know, close old witches they knew. Okay. Yeah, so they do um, you know, they do rituals and ceremonies in honour, pretty much in honour of everything around that particular time of the year in the nature that's what mm. they believe in. Okay. I think um, a, a lot of take modern weekends would tend to emphasise a worship of the goddess. Yeah. They'd say the goddess is a triple goddess. I, I often think that's really quite an interesting idea. And perhaps they wouldn't formulate it in the way of it being a goddess they worship as such. But they'd say within all of us, there is an aspect of the mother, the maiden, and the crone. The maiden is the vigorous time. The mother is the responsible time. And the crone is a time of wisdom. We've used words like old crone as a term of abuse. Um, but if you look at things like the rise of nature, uh, the worship of nature, the pantheism, panentheism as they call it sometimes, you've got, um, you've got the idea of the rise of feminism, of ecology. You know, that's an aspect of it. Perhaps not seen in terms of its pagan or whatever, but it's a sort of like a wider social aspect of it. Mm. We're gentler, we're kinder. 
the rise of the talking therapies, the rise of shamanic practices out there. It's the same thing. We're, 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 we are moving away from a, um, a, a central certainty to a more fuzzy, gentle, uh, tolerant, open way of recognising the goddess and the god within ourselves. Yeah. Okay. The positive male and the female. And in the shamanic tradition, this goddess would be the earth. Yes. And the god energy would be the sky. Okay. They bring together. So again, that's Ooh. what we make invoke the god, the god, the goddess. You know, again, that the nature. Yes. Yeah. Term, so that's classed with the goddess. Yes. Yeah. Well. Okay. Yeah. If you think of modern, um, fact, we we have Saint Bridget. Yeah. Saint Bridget uh, is the is a patron saint of creativity, of work, of making things. If you go back to a Celtic time. The, the Celtic goddess is Bridget in the triple form. Bridget, Brigantia, Bride. Triple goddess. Triple goddess. Okay, cool. That's fascinating, isn't it? Mm. Okay, cool. Um, okay, so the next question I'm going to ask is to Martin this time. Yeah. Uh, how do witches view Christianity? Are witches anti Christian? No, but many Christians are anti witchcraft. Um, Largely, it's brought out of ignorance and not knowing. I'm not saying that all Christians are ignorant, but I'm saying that a significant <laughs> proportion of <laughs> <laughs> the witch burning, which will be burned off. Uh, I, I think the idea is that if you honour nature and respect yourself and believe that everybody has their own path in life, then that's fine. You can believe that. Think, you, you wouldn't get um, groups of um, witches knocking on doors trying to convert people. There would be a tradition that you come to it, mm. you would find it. Yeah. It's by finding the stuff within yourself. So I would not say, there's, there's a bit in the Bible that's often frequently um, quoted, it says, you shall not suffer a witch to live. <laughs> it's actually a mistranslation. Okay. In Hebrew, the word is poisoner. Yeah. Okay. Because in Hebrew you leave out the vowels, mm. and some nice polite guys about this about the 16th century decided to translate poison as witch. <laughs> so yeah. that's it. Funny that. Yeah. So what you have is that I mean there are organisations. There are. Uh, I have a friend who is a very um, involved in these, a druid, shall we say, and he frequently associates with Christians who are of the more Celtic variety. And they value each other's spirituality. The problem comes is if I believe that I'm right and you're going to hell. It's very comforting. Oh, that is sometimes because it says I'm okay and you're not. Mm -hmm. But witches would not be interested or pagans would not be interested in trying to convert. They might have a dialogue. But they do have an awful long memory. But they wouldn't expect you to follow their tradition, yeah. their path. Everybody's path... Rather like Buddha said, um, my path is my path. If you find value in it, please do it. But adapt it to your own needs yeah. and your own approaches. So in a way, it's a bit like life, you know, when we go through life, we learn new things, new yes. experiences, and we're finding our own identities as human beings. That's what we're doing. Sure. Yeah. So that they wouldn't expect to force that upon us. No, not at all. No, no. Okay, that's, that's not at all. No, no. Okay. Uh, this question is going to be aimed at Anthony, uh, Antonina. Um, can I follow the path of Wicca or witchcraft and be a Christian too? You can have, yeah, I'm sure. I know there's quite a few people who are actually into Wicca, mm. into what they want to come out of, probably got Christian values. Mm. There's no problem. I think it all depends how far down the Christian path you go in. Because you probably end up co contradicting yourself, I would feel. Mm. Because if you're a devout Christian, you probably wouldn't even think about becoming you know, into witchcraft. But if you just like got a few Christian beliefs, like the eternal spirit and all their values, about it. so they're looking always, you know, pretty open-minded Christianity. Mm -hmm. As in, it's like you know, the resurrection, saying, like, "Well, there's a spirit essence that comes back." And all that. So maybe you would be a bit more, you know, to taken towards the Wiccan path. So then you probably go down the path and you see this very loose. This could be some. Yes, I think that's very interesting because if you look at certain parallels, um, there is the idea of the child of light being born around Christmas. Yeah. yeah. 
there is the idea in Judaism of angelics. And in Hebrew, the name of the God is Yahweh Elohim, which means the God that is both male and female. And modern Kabbalah, I think Madonna's very much into that, would tend to go down that sort of mm. approach. So there are people who would have gone along quite adequately with Christian beliefs and gone out and celebrated in the traditional ways. Yeah. Okay. Um, it, 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 it's, the problem is that none of these things are as absolute as Anthony said. Mm. You know, there might be all different... The idea of um, praying, contemplation, meditation, mm. um, but belongs in many traditions. And we know that people who meditate frequently have similar experiences. Yeah. That, that takes part in um, modern paganism. It takes part in most many religions. It's where you get the idea that I'm right and you're wrong. Yeah. And the problem is, you know, it doesn't really matter. You might be able to work out a pattern that fits in. Mm. Okay. Um, okay, so it, witchcraft, is it a cult? No. Let's give a difference between a cult. A cult is a charismatic organisation where one person dominates, yeah, and that person is the new messiah, or the person who is the one who God speaks to directly and doesn't speak to anybody else. Mm. Yeah, a cult works like that. Um, Wicca, shamanism does not operate on the dominance of people. Yeah, because a cult is a fallen, isn't it? Yeah. And, and not everyone can, you know, follow that path of witchcraft. Some people may, may choose not to do it. Uh, sure. I mean, with cults, as you've seen, as a term, it's more of a controlling by a particular person. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's been lots of religious cults, such as, a, you know, like Waco, for instance, that were mm -hmm. religious. So yeah. There's only religious views. And I'm sure... You know, like Christianity, I'm sure there's probably been Wiccan cults. Now, oh, yes. Saying yes. that, you of know, course. cons, which have been very controlling and very yes. secretive, yes. powered yes. by a dominant person. But Wicca as a cult, no. No, no, no. It's, not, it's, it's not powerful in that way. No. Right, okay. I mean, you get cults, not only in religion and spirituality, you sure. get cults in money-making schemes. You get cults in dominant personalities. You get certain therapies that can be dominated by one dominant figure that could fulfil a cult phenomenon. Okay. The idea is, if you're allowed to criticise, if you're able to put your own view in and make sense of it, and decide things, then that's not a cult. Okay. Yeah? Yeah. So, classically, Wicca, Shaman, it does not fit into that pattern. There may be cases where things go a little strange. But, hey, they go strange... How many pagan priests, priestesses have been charged with doing things they shouldn't? Mm. Perhaps a few, but I think the larger ones tend to be in other organisations. Yeah, yeah. You know? Yes. <laughs> 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 we'll move on to our next question. Yeah, we'll on. <laughs> Do witches cast spells? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah, they, would, <laughs> they would do a technology, they would, they would use that. <laughs> Um, yeah. they, would, they would say that they are helping people. Sure. Just as clearing a home of negative energy, just as um, re registering, finding out what goes on, is important. Yeah? That's part of it. It's how you settle space that is clear and fresh. If I'm working with a client who is emotionally disturbed, at the end of the session, I will go and wash my face, I will light some incense, and I will get the room feeling back to the way it was. Okay. Is that a spell? I don't know. It's an intent for it. It's an intent for it, yes. So that would be class if you were Technically. a witch. As a spell. As a spell. As a spell. Yeah, okay. yeah. And the essence of spells is that like affects like. Yeah. There's a correspondence between um, too much gold and you get jaundice. Yeah, um, that's a Greek peasant idea. Yeah, things are similar, and by working on something that's similar, you affect something else. The idea is as above, so below. 
So the word spell, that, that could be classed as a state of mind as well, can it? Of course it could be. Yeah, it, it, it could be classed in other ways. I mean, suppose I, I, I was walking along the road and I saw Anthony, and I, so every morning I said, oh, Anthony, you look bloody awful today. <laughs> and I look really, really, really bad every morning. He'd avoid me. Hmm. Because my intent, yeah, would be to do that. We all know people who drain us emotionally. Mm -hmm. They put their negativity, they have the worst possible interpretations. That's a spell. So spell and magic aren't the same thing, then? Spell is a technology, magic is a, a knowledge of what they're doing. Yeah. Oh, okay, that's fair enough. I just wanted to clarify the difference yeah. between spell and magic. Because I, I know some viewers think that spell and magic mean the same thing. Or, or yes, they would. Yeah. This is the area that people yeah. go, oh God, I don't know if I'm going to watch it. Oh, I don't know, I'm not, I don't like to talk about which is all bad and evil. It's like, you know, when you go buy a lottery ticket and cross your fingers. Yeah. That's an intent. That could be a spell. class is a spell. Yeah. You know, this is going to be the lucky one. Pretty pretty. Yeah. Because you're doing that to make it, to give you the, the good luck to yeah. the thing you're going to win. Yeah. 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 Positive yeah. energy. Yeah. I mean, if you use a word like voodoo, the first thing people imagine voodoo is that people do unmentionable things and dance around with zombies. Yeah. Now, voodoo itself um, is based in, it's, bre it's, it's broken up into three. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Pedro. I forget what the other two are, but there's good, bad, and indifferent. And the idea is that a lot of voodoo skills are about herbs and such things. That's, but it's about dance. But all the world, but, but the word voodoo has become very negative. Yeah. 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 I yeah. mean, there's a very simple idea. In certain parts of the United States, in the Deep South, there is a, a group of uh, evangelical Christians who are calling it the prosperity gospel. And if you're not making money, it's because God is a bit used off with you. And you don't earn money because you've been a bad boy. So can you imagine the effect of thinking, oh, I'm not making much money, though, I must be wrong, I must be evil. Yeah? yeah. You've got that sort of thing. So is voodoo a form of punishment that people can, someone can inflict on somebody, or is it a form of magic? It's like anything. It's anything. It's anything. Anything can be used for good or bad. There's nothing good or bad, Horatio, but thinking makes it so. Yeah. Quite Af Shakespeare. Af Afro-Caribbean form of shamanism. It is, isn't it? Yeah. And yeah. it's like with everything. It's like with this, anyway, it's our intent, it can be used in positive or negative way. It all depends on what the recipient and what the focus is. So like if the Hulu, like Hulu, like every other tradition, it's the same stuff. You know, it's like Wicca, modern Wicca, Judaism. Yeah. Yes. It's the same, you said, you know, it's an intent, it's a celebration of a particular energy. And, uh, okay. It's used for good, we can use it bad, just like anyone else that can, again, can be used for good. Like, like the internet can be yeah. used for good or for bad. Yeah, of course, yeah. yeah. Okay, well, that's, that's fine. Uh, okay, moving on um, to our next subject, uh, neo-paganism in the modern world. Okay, and I'll start off my first question to Anthony. First of all, for those who are out there, uh, our viewers, who don't know what, what is neo-paganism? I think neo-paganism is uh, pretty much, how could I describe it? I think it's just like here and now, just regular mm. without the bells and without the cloaks and without the, mm. I mean myself, like you know, I practice chapman. I'm not dressing up as a saint that you and chapman would do. No. Because I live in 21st century Wales, yeah. whereas the traditional shamans, they live in 21st century Siberia, when they are, uh, you know, traditions are different to mine, but still have a big ceremonial gear up because of the climate and because of where we live. And neo pagan, I think, is a westernized term. It is. As to be all classed as one, from shamans to Druidism to Wiccans. Mm. So we just call that neo pagans, we all go to festivals together and have a coloured shirt and we'll have a good time. Okay, I think that's what it is. Too. Yeah, I, th I think that's interesting. I, I think there's um, what you could say. So I don't know how many of you know when the Witchcraft Act was repealed. Uh, that, do I guess? Uh, 1940. 51. 51. 51. Okay. Yeah. yeah. The right. last witchcraft trial, which was dropped, was sometime during World War II. But um, what happened was that there have been three currents, if you like, that have formed neo paganism in the modern world. There are what we would call the traditionals. They are small groups of people who perhaps have passed the tradition on from family member to family member. Yeah? They might call themselves hereditary witches. Mm -hmm. I have a friend who has a Cambridge MA, who lives near Bath, who has a Cambridge degree in history, and was brought up <laughs> as she called herself as a witch. <laughs> there are people like Gerald Gardner, who was a retired civil servant, who started setting up Gardenarian covens just after World War II. And in the 60s, there was uh, Alex, Alexander Saunders who 
set up uh, Alexandrian covens, which were a little more elaborate. So you've got three currents like that in your writing. Um, and modern paganism uh, largely became more popular because people began to write books. Um, there's, guy, there's a woman called, uh, she's a distant relative of the psychologist Adler. She wrote a book called Drawing Down the Moon. And it was uh, looking at what modern neo-pagans believe. There's a very distinguished anthropologist called uh, Tanya Lerman, who wrote a book called Persuasions of the Witch's Craft. And she, as an anthropologist, which is where my interest in all this lies, is, um, uh, is to study what people said they did. So neo-paganism is a complex mixture of things that are evolving, yeah. but it worships the feminine, in a sense, and values nature. Three principles of paganism are essentially the divine feminine, the, the masculinity and femininity in the divinity, honour nature, and do what thou will, but harm no one. Now that's the golden rule that you can find in all religions. So that's effectively, it, it's an attempt to make sense of the world and to find the sacred and the holy in ourselves and in the religion. Okay. Okay, so it's, it's embracing nature and... Uh, oh yes, that's the most yeah. primary important thing. Okay. Okay, so uh, the next question I'm going to ask you is, how long has it been around for? How long has the epigraphy been around for? Do you want to? I think it's been around pretty much as... Um, I think it's neo-paganism as a term. I feel it's more of a modern thing, so mm -hmm. I would definitely say 20th century, just maybe yeah. after the Second World War, when yeah. these are the fruits of the Galadian tradition. Yes, yes. Say. I think when the, they were branching off, more books were coming out, yes. more text. When people, as a society, felt it was more okay to write about this and let it out in the workforce, people were beginning to open up their minds a bit wider. So I think it really enlightened, and it really came home, I think, during the 60s. It did, yeah. Yeah. yes, in the 60s. <laughs> I mean, in some places like modern Italy, there are traditional people called Stregia, who are um, uh, traditional believers. You get it all over Europe. It's still there, but it, it, it has, if you like, more books have been written about it, the internet is there, mm -hmm. it, it is more possible to get information, and as more people discover things about that, um, people begin to develop an interest in it. Yeah. Okay. But, you know. So does it have a place in the modern world? Well, I think that's another question. <laughs> <laughs> if you wish to regard the world is a place to be preserved, to honour nature, to not see the planet as something we use. <coughs> I mean, incidentally, in the book of Genesis, uh, it's often translated that God makes man, man, master of the animals. <laughs> the actual translation in the Hebrew is not master, it's steward. And the term stewardship means looking after and guarding. Yes. Perhaps the role is that as ecology rises, as feminism and equality arises, perhaps we are becoming more to be seen as stewards, the masters. We are a part of the world. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I mean, we forget that quite easily. We do very easily. I mean, if you think of it like this, I mean, let's put, let's, let's put this idea of the, of the coven in its context. There were 13 knights of the round table with 13 disciples. There are traditionally 13 in a, in a, in a, in a in coven. Um, when uh, there are three levels of initiation into uh, Wicca, um, there are three levels of initiation in Freemasonry, there are three levels of initiation in the Royal Antediluvian Order of the Buffalo, um, and I, I do know of um, at least one Freemason who is a practicing Wicca. Um, you'd be surprised at the crossover. Mm. And, and just as Freemasonry probably gets um, a lot of idea of strange rituals in our secret temples where odd things happen, you get the same sort of prejudices about Freemasonry mm. as you do about uh, Wiccans and, and so on. Okay, my next question I was going to ask you is uh, was neo paganism influenced by witchcraft? Do they marry each other? Right, right. That's interesting. <laughs> um, 
Let's put it like this. I want to distinguish between neo-paganism and new age. Perhaps new age is where my prejudice begin to show. <laughs> new age and paganism, neo-paganism, are different things. Many people confuse them. Um, new age is largely an American phenomenon, which is about looking for the best in all ways, which may well bring a lot of people up. But neo-paganism is something that helps people make sense. Its worldview is tolerant. It wouldn't judge somebody on their race, on their sexuality, their class, or whatever. So its role is liberating, um, tolerant, and open to anybody who wishes to find out about it. My fascination with new religious movements, new spiritual movements, comes from that. And I am yet to come across something that really frightens me. Okay. No, that's, that's, that's fine. I believe that. Yeah. Okay, moving on to our next subject. Um, <laughs> interesting one. Alien abduction. Whoa. Whoa. Big leap. Yes. Okay, <laughs> so, we've, so we've gone from uh, <laughs> one end of the spectrum to the other now, slightly. Okay, so why do... Well, why are we here? Does anyone know why we're here? Why are we on this planet? Why do we exist? Why are we on this planet? It's right. an interesting question, isn't it? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you look at the scientists, the scientists say that perhaps um, there are two views here. Um, if you think of the universe as the size it is, it's fairly unlikely that we are the only beings in the universe. Um, so, that tells us that on this planet we happen to be uniquely situated with the right materials, with the moon in the right place, uh, so that life could begin. Let's remember that if you thought of the creation of life at 24 hour clock, we've only been here for the last 30 seconds. Yeah. Life has. Yeah. And humanity has only been here for the last 10 seconds, 5 seconds. So let's put it in that perspective. Um, we're here because we were lucky that something happened that life burst into action, and here we are. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so perhaps our role there is to understand and to say what is out there, and why are we here, what's it about, what can we read from the night sky, are we alone? Okay, yeah, that's fine. Uh, right, aliens, um, why do they abduct us? Do you think it's to do with experiments on us or learn about our physical makeup? All this abduction yeah. stuff, yeah, go on. I feel is a bit far out there, man. Let's put it that way. It always amazes me with the abductions. It makes me wonder why these alien beings who come hundreds of millions of light years away from their planet just to pop down here and nick one of us and our little programmers. I mean, why would they do that? You know? The only thing I can think of, which would probably add up, is if, if we go into conspiracy theories here, okay, yeah. which is the internet is absolutely full of it, is that we actually coexist and living alongside alien beings always have done from the beginning. Yeah. And there are no governments. And now times out of ten, something happens and it can't be explained, so they'll blame something like alien abduction for a particular capital mutilation, alien abduction. But what we're forgetting, when we come from this, you know, as well as we knew this alien abduction stuff, since modern world, really, mm -hmm. I mean, before that, cattle mutilations could have quite often happened by wild animals or something, but they say, oh yeah, the precise cuts, that could all be coming up soon. They could actually cut that out anyway with spears, you know, it's all conspiracy stuff. But, you know, the alien abduction thing, I'm sure I feel that it's a bit plausible, to say the least. <laughs> yeah, okay. I mean, I think that there are cases where strange things have happened. Uh, Johnny Mack, who was um, quite a distinguished scientist, did interview people in the States who he claimed had had, had this experience. Um, my own view is that I'm sure that if it happened as frequently as it's properly said, uh, we would notice the damn sight more. Mm -hmm. The issue is not so much alien abduction, but whether there are other life forms out there. My friend uh, uh, David Lee Richards has written a book on UFO whales, and he's looked at particular UFO sightings in whales. And he, he, as you say, can you imagine 
the implications for, for everybody of discovering that there were other people out there. There are cases where Winston Churchill said, we can't let ordinary people know about this. There were certain things that didn't want, because that would destroy the organised churches. The idea that there may be people out there who are more civilised, more sophisticated, and have gone through the nuclear age, and have not blown themselves to pieces, might indicate that we have reasons to be quarantined in this part of the galaxy, and kept away until we prove whether we make it or not. Um, Carl Jung was of the opinion that flying saucers were visionary rumours. Um, but we do know that there is an awful lot of stuff that isn't explicable. Um, but the idea of abduction perhaps is a worse nightmare yeah. in that sense. Um, I do think it's worth looking at the phenomena and it's worth analysing the people who say they have. My, my, my inclination would be to, do, to get rid of 98% of cases and really look at those 2% where different things have happened. Um, you know, idea of men in black and guys and uh, and uh, certain more loony ideas about uh, um, reptiles who are members of the royal family and masquerade yes. as a royal family and uh, members of you know Ted Heath and Tony Blair. All I can say is, if they are aliens or abduct, you know, doing these things, I'm sure they'd be better at doing the policies than we've experienced. Um, but that's me being a bit tongue in cheek. Yeah, and they thought they'd be better actually hiding themselves. Oh, hiding themselves. Yeah. 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 yeah, that queen is an alien. They go, come on, that's an alien. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure I'm calling into this <laughs> idea of um, <laughs> shapeshifters. There are many uh, reptiles. They don't form as reptiles. They happen to be the chair people of multinational corporations. <laughs> but they act like reptiles. They don't look like them. No, that's it. <laughs> So when these philosophers prophesizing that the world is going to end, does, does that, that have anything to do with the induction? Or, or you mean this Mayan stuff? Yes, yeah. Well, um, I don't know anything to say about that. I've got lots to say about that, but do you want to say that something first about that? Yeah, generally I think the only way that cataclysmic change will happen is by our own hands. Okay. I.e. if we dusted up in the Middle East and it turns out to be World War Three, that could be a cataclysmic change for the world, where the world could end as we know it, but not end as in wiped out. Ah, oh, okay, yeah. You know, it could end and it would be set back, you know, a couple of, uh, couple of you know, 10, 20 years in the technological front as well. We have to try and clear up the nuclear fallout. Mm. Okay. Generally, and that then we'll have to go back to basics, because a lot of these, uh, you know, forums about the 2012 model are going back, we would need to go, go back to learn about our survivalist skills and, you know, mm. back to the basics working with the land and how to produce food. Due to that reason, and I feel that would probably be the only cause, really. There's a lot of saying as well about to coincide with the, the planet X, is a theory which is going to come up and turn up on the, the day 21st and 12th, which is the planet, and these aliens from this other planet are going to jump and yeah. disclose themselves to us, and then we're going to be all enlightened beings and go to the land and go off with them and leave our little rock. Just grab them. There's lots of things, but the one I feel realistically out of all of it would be. A nuclear fallout of the world was yes. pretty, pretty much. Yeah, but that's going to end the world. Isn't it? the world's going to be destroyed then. And, uh, yeah, well, the end is such. You know, take it back a bit. They're knocking out the track. Do yeah, we, of we, course. We, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we have a, like a couple of a nuclear winter for a couple of years. But, you know, we will recover. Mm. Because the worst is happening. Yes. Of course, we've been hit by asteroids and time wiped today. So that when we came back. Yes. Okay. I mean, I, th I think historically, what we have to remember is that humanity has now reached a point where we would survive 98, 99% of us were wiped out. We have the internet, we have the storing of information and computers that would always be there. It's not going to be like the Dark Ages, mm. where knowledge disappeared. That we, we are now, we have technology for good or bad. And I do think a lot of these prophecies about the Mayan calendar, well, we'll know on December the 21st yes. this year. I'm confidently, I retire, I'll get my pension starts uh, next year. <laughs> And I think most churches don't for the world has ended. But the point is, let's put it really sensibly. The Mayans were doing this calendar uh, 700, 800, 900, 1100 years ago. I'm sure if you were designing a calendar in those days, and you said, oh, okay, we'll go forward a thousand years, but, you know, let's make it, let's make it, the, let's make it the, lunar, the, lunar, the, the, the lunar equinox. That's as far as we'll yeah. go. Yeah. 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 I don't really think that there is going to be a spectacular no. thing. What changes society are things like 
bad things happening like Chernobyl. That makes people more aware of what's going on. Anthony's concerned about nuclear power. You know, we, we say that, oh, nuclear power's the future. Wait, what do we do with the waste? We stash it in the earth for a quarter of a million years. Yeah. Um, what's that going to do to us, you know? The, the, the idea of catastrophe has always been with us. The idea of the end of the world is uniquely a Christian idea. Yeah. Um, to the ancients, the world kept on going. Aristotle said the world's always been here, mm. and it always will be. Yeah. Uh, the idea that there's the end of days is a very spectacular thing. It, it always arises at times of economic crisis. It always arises at times when things are going wrong. Um, the end of the world was coming when Attila the Hun showed up and Genghis Khan, yeah. when the city of Rome was sacked. The early church believed that Christ was about to return and the world was going to end. Mm. The famous text, the book of Revelations, was written about the Emperor Nero. It was not written of John the Apostle, it was written by John of Padmos. Who wanted... So the book of Revelations is an out-of-date, traditional apocalyptic literature about end times but it doesn't exist in the east it's a uniquely western idea that the world will end in that sense yeah. so I, I think that a lot of it is fear and I have been interested to see what the next day of evolution is <laughs> okay. the next end of world day after the 21st coming up precisely yes okay, okay moving on um, the next question I wanted to ask is do you think that ones that we will encounter will uh, be a resource to explore and collect? Sorry, I'm sorry, I'll rephrase the question. Sorry, I made a mistake with that. Uh, do you think there could be misidentification and hoaxing with um, extraterrestrial life? Well, yes, I think there could be. Yeah. But if alien life does exist out there, yeah. we ask the question would we recognise it? Mm. True. Would it necessarily be based on carbon and the need for water? Sure. There are life forms that use silicon at the bottom of our oceans. We know more about space than we do about the bottom of the oceans. And I think that just as perhaps an ant does not recognise that we are here, how would we know if, if we haven't been visited, or in fact, would we recognise it? Life forms on the moons of Jupiter would be below the ice. Is it Europa? Yeah. There's water there. Other life forms there. So we nothing above this bloody ice sheet. Um, would we recognise it? You know? Would, would, would that be the case? Mm. I think the evidence is that um, it comes down to recognising it as life. Yeah. And it comes down to recognising it as sentient. Yeah, and it could be just like, it could be just a, you know, like these flying sources we see. Generally, and the way they move, they themselves can't, does not necessarily have to be a machine. It could be some natural energy yeah. or a, yeah. a living energy thing that we haven't uh, found or got hold of it yet. For the mm. scientists to actually put under a microscope and say, all right, it's just like people just pure, pure energy. Yeah, 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 people have interpreted them as aliens and yeah. alien life forms. You know, people mm. forget as well, when it comes to alien spacecraft and UFOs, so many different things. You know, the yeah. identified flight logic is in that fact what it is, you know, it's not identified to what we know it as. You know. I mean, let's, let's, let's look at the origin of the word alien, alienist. An alien is somebody who does not um, belong. Yeah. In society, the old name for psychiatry was alienists, those who determined what was acceptable and what was not. I always remember a particular edition of Frasier, where a, a politician is running for election, and uh, Frasier thinks he's wonderful because he's looking after the aliens who are immigrants into the States, and they're being accepted. But of course, everybody thinks that, that this politician is talking about aliens from outer space. Yeah. So he gets thrashed in the election because they think he's a nutter. <laughs> It's how we determine what is acceptable and what is not acceptable, what is belief and what is not. One view says that the whole universe, that it's just this place here in Earth where there was just the right amount of energy, the right amount of place for life to happen. Or in a, in a universe like this, which is so vast. Life as we know it is a creature. Yeah. 
that 75%, 95% of the matter in the universe is made up of dark energy or dark matter, which we can't see. We are only seeing 1 in 20%, 5%. Who knows what happens in that sort of experience? What life is like, you know? Or what life forms is, what consciousness is. How do we know? Would we even recognise them if we saw them? Would they recognise us? Okay, we'll move on to our next subject, and uh, we're going to talk about fairies, uh, fairy ah, abduction. Yes. Okay. Fair ah. Right, first of all, um, what are fairies? I, I'm going to aim this question to both of you. What are fairies? Do you want to and, start and how does that differ from alien abduction? Is it, is it the same thing? Do you know fair folk are and fair folk abductions? I think it's like the 19th, 20th century's version of alien abduction, so it's today. Okay. Yeah, there's always something else to blame, something else You're missing with someone. Fair folk, I myself have had experience with. And what's happened is that with everything, a belief or a lack of belief, and the lack of belief has made them, the fair folk as they were, go away from us. They've become repelled by us humans because of our low density of vibration, our way we operate, the way we act, the way we just give, you know, half, 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 take, 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 not give back. And they become repelled at that because. I mean, with Wigger and Pagans and all that, they actually spend time and actually build up a relationship with the faithful. Because they like to um, give and then to receive and then to give an exchange of energies. And then we become more respectful of that. Because we just come along and we bulldoze a big land forest out the way. And build a big old load of houses and exploit all the energy from that one. And all when the faithful come around and start abducting us. To give us, you know, to show us the lesson and show us, you know, you can't do that, you know, okay. we're out of balance. Okay. So I think that's what my first one. Mm. I think that's very interesting. I mean, when we think of fairies today, um, we think of Walt Disney's fairies. We think of what's a fairy, isn't it? What's the name Tinkerbell? Yeah. And that's Americanisation yeah. of a traditional belief. The fairy folk in traditional Celtic belief was, uh, were, which are, they're not gentle and they're not subtle. No. Uh, you could believe in that tradition that they are, if you like, guardians of the traditional places. Um, we have a place in Neath called Fairyland. Some people say it's down, it's down to the amount of drugs that are taken in that area. <laughs> but uh, traditionally it was more to do with the idea that there were fairy rings and fairy folk danced. Sometimes they're called the Seely Court. And um, to most people in, say, the 16th century, there would always be these figures who were to be respected, would look after you if you looked after them, would guard your land, guard your animals, yeah. and so on. Um, the idea of um, changelings, people who are a little different, being swapped over. And there is that uh, belief that if you go along to Fairyland, you might lose touch with time. There was a film recently called The Steely Week Chronicles or something about that sort of idea. Yeah. And there is the idea that if you get marched off to Fairyland, you have a way of the time and you drink and you make love and you would want to come back. Um, which is interesting. We go back to the alien abduction. Yeah. Uh, in yeah. certain cases, you get stories like that. Uh, that, that, that it may simply be that the modern version, as you said, of the of the fairy ab of the alien abduction is the fairy abduction. Yeah. You know, we say away with the fairies when mm. we want to describe people as different to us. And fairies uh, used to be twenty or thirty years ago a term of abuse for gay people. Yeah. Okay. Um, but that's that's like sort of influencing um, uh, popular notions. Well, I'll give you a prime example of how we change ideas. Father Christmas does not wear red. Yeah. Do you know why Father Christmas wears red? Yeah. Coca-Cola decided that they wanted to have it the same colour. Okay. If you go back, if you read Charles Dickens's um, Christmas Carol, green. The, uh, the ghost of Christmas Present <laughs> wears a green robe, has a beard, and is essentially um, a fairy, yeah. if you like, who looks after that traditional time of year, that midwinter feast. Saturn, where, 
Saturnalia. Saturnalia. Yeah. That's it. yeah. And you, you have to look at the origins of these legends. Um, traditionally, beliefs like that, so like St. Nicholas, Father Christmas, so on, fairies, their attempts to explain other existences and the way we need to honour things. All we try and do is establish how people interpret the world. Okay, so um, fairies, uh, are they a symbol of innocence or are they a symbol of evil? Uh, are, are their intentions always good or are they always well? Yeah, their intention is um, not good, not bad, is what is needed at the time to put yeah. things into balance, I feel. You know, especially if we can walk and stumble in upon a power place where the fair folk mm. reside. Or we come up and kick in it and, and all that stuff and showing no respect. Their intentions towards us will be a class as a right, okay, negative thing. You know, you're going to have to have it back. Three-fold law is supposed to be. Three-fold law? Yeah. yeah no, sure to yes, that's an interesting point, yes. The idea of the fairies being good or bad means, would you say that people are good or bad? Yeah, there are some people who are good, there are some people who are bad. Oh yeah, of course this is. Um, so, a lot of this goes down to the prejudices of the church. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm sorry guys, we're giving you a hard time tonight. Um, but, uh, nature is just nature. Nature needs protecting. Yes. Um, traditional ways of looking after animals. We have a rise of organic agriculture. We honour the animals more. Can we really say that we honour the natural world when we have machine we have slaughterhouses in America that a touch of a computer button can slaughter thirty thousand hogs? What sort of energy does that give to the way we look after the world? Bloody awful yes. yeah. Just hang in the air that energy as well. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you know, and, and, and when, when traditional people kill animals, they honour the animal, they thank it for its sacrifice. Um, they don't, um, they don't uh, say oh, it's just a piece of meat. But, it, but it's against the animals, will then? Yeah. They've been sacrificed to you know, they didn't, yeah. Uh, yeah, many children find it very difficult to connect the cows in the field with the boxes of meat you get into the field. And we begin, to, we begin to need to ask questions like that. Are we honouring the old ways? That's how people would, would look at it. Okay. Right, uh, let's see. Um, okay, so how long has this myth been around for, this fairy myth? I think it probably goes way back to like, you know, Celtic times when the mm. you know, Druids used yeah. to work with the fair folk, I suppose, to give them guidance and to actually help. I mean, fair folk doesn't exactly mean to be a little pixie or anything like that. It could actually be an energy or a spirit of a tree, you know, which would become a thing when they go to visit to it, like a, in, a, in a state of a bliss, would it be better swears, and actually ask the tree, essence, tree spirit, for guidance and how to use its energy. Mm. And then there would be other spirits around also, which would be the class of the fifth. And again, to build up a relationship and ask them what they could do for the, the dream it. So, you know, we back even before pre Roman times, I think, fair folk. Okay. Mm. Yeah, the idea of sentience, of so thing is aware, and we need to look after it. We are stewards. We need to be in balance. We need to be in balance. That's yeah. it. Well, I think the world needs, needs a sense of balance anyway, doesn't it? You know, and uh, that's fine. Okay, so do you think that some of these cases could be a state of mind, maybe, perhaps? Or um, is, is it our imagination that these. Yeah, but who installed that? say in the state of mind and imagination in the first place, is that because the way psycho psychology has come mm. around and yes. that has been put in yes. as an excuse for what you're seeing is a part of your mind frame of your imagination. Or before all that, if we go out about 300 years back, and then what was the classes then? Mm. Were you classed as the, the local shaman? Were mm. you classed as the local wise woman? Mm. You know? But before that, now it's been like kind of turned back on itself and said, well, it's a frame of your imagination, but sometimes is it? Yeah, is it or have you actually seen it yourself, you know? And, yeah. uh, and yeah. no, no, I mean, there are definitely cases that frequently people don't notice what they take for granted. People are told they don't see things or experience things. There's a very famous case where a man robbed a bank in New York. He was stark naked, he was six or five, he was carrying a shotgun. When they asked people what they noticed, you'd be surprised what they noticed. Yeah. It's what you look for, it's what you see. 
And that can be for the truth or it can be for delusion. People can want to see things that they insist are there. They can interpret what people say in different ways. Yes, yeah. Um, it may simply be that we are told things we don't see them because we're told they're not there. Perhaps we should listen to children's imagination. Yeah, yeah. We've been installed in this through our educational system, which put the old blinkers on. Mm. And of course, we're all different. We all have our own interpretations of things and how we perceive yeah. the world. Yeah, and see the world differently. Yeah. You're not unique because that's what makes us unique. Yeah. Okay, yeah. that's fine. Yeah, okay, well, I think we'll end it there now. Um, I want to thank you both for uh, coming here and doing uh, our show. Uh, it's been a pleasure, it's been great talking to you and asking the questions, and uh, you've answered them brilliantly, thank you. As, as always. Thank, thank, thank you, Martin, and uh, thanks, Anthony. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, that's it uh, for this uh, week's of edition of uh, South Wales Ghost Watch. And, um, well, tune in next week, uh, next Thursday as normal, usual time, 7 o'clock. And my name's Adam, and thank you very much. And as Dave Allen would just say, may your gods or goddesses go with you. Yeah. Before we go offline as well, we'd just have one question off Carl. Do you want to take that? Oh, yes, okay. Um, sorry, before we go, we just got one uh, question off um, Carl. Off uh, Carl. Um, the Pyramid of Giza, was was it made by our old ancestors, or, or is it a power plant? <laughs> Are we going into conspiracy theory of this? I feel um, that it was a... Where the pyramid is, I think that's where the ground level was, and they mined it down. And it was natural, so they found natural stone formations there in the ground, and they just mined it down and got rid of all. That's my personal yeah, theory. I, I think the uh, I think the pyramid is is a is a pointing to the stars. It's a symmetrical, it's a geometrical object, and we know very little of what they were really for. Um, Egyptian civilization operated in an entirely different way to what we know. And I think there's a lot of speculation, a lot of nonsense spoken about it, but also a lot of very interesting things are spoken about it as well. Are we scratching the surface? We're scratching the surface. Okay. okay, sorry Carl to, uh, well, cut you off there, but great. Uh, um, we got this last question in for you anyway, and uh, it was yeah. answered brilliantly by Martin. So there we are. Um, I'm going to leave you now for this week's edition of uh, South Wales Ghost Watch. I will see you next Thursday, usual time, 7 o'clock. Cheers. Tune in then. Bye.